I can never figure out why after a magnificent concert like that, which has lifted our hearts as it did to praise God, we're not just translated immediately into heaven. I have to admit I have a selfish reason for those thoughts, and that is I'm very well aware that I can't sing as the soloists and the choir did, but I want to, and the only hope I have of that is translation, <laughs> because one day we're going to be able to praise God as we should and join in that great heavenly chorus. The other problem I have is a little more immediate, and that is I can't understand why R.C. Sproul is not giving this address. I've been trying to figure it out. I don't think it's because he has abandoned the doctrine of justification by faith, and I don't think it's because he's tired talking about it. The only thing I can figure out is that he has been talking about it and you aren't listening. <laughs> and so he said, when we do the conference this year, let's have somebody else do it. Maybe they'll listen to Jim Boyce. Well, we're going to talk about justification by faith. I have a very good friend. We all know him. His name is John Armstrong, a Reformed Baptist, was a pastor for many years, 22 years out in the Chicago area, and is now the head of a work called Reformation and Revival Ministries. Just a little less than a year ago, he published a book called The Coming Crisis in Evangelicalism. I was talking to John shortly after that book came out, and I said to him, John, when you title your book The Coming Crisis, and evangelicalism, do you mean by that that you think the crisis is still coming or might it already be here? And he said to me, I have to admit that when I think about it, I think it's already here. The evangelical church is in bad trouble today, and part of the problem is that we don't even know it. We've abandoned our theology, we're substituting other things for the Word of God, and we don't even know it's what we're doing. I was very struck in recent years by the titles of books by people that are well known to most of you. David Wells, for example, has written a book, No Place for Truth. John MacArthur, who is speaking at this conference, wrote Ashamed of the Gospel. And Michael Scott Horton, a young man, has written Power Religion. What struck me about those three books are not so much the titles I just read to you as the subtitles. Because when David Wells wrote his book, No Place for Truth, he added the subtitle, Or Whatever Happened to Evangelical Theology. And when John MacArthur wrote his book, Ashamed of the Gospel, he added on the words, When the Church Becomes Like the World. And Mike Horton in Power Religion added the words, The Selling Out of the Evangelical Church. Now, those three men come from three very different backgrounds that are engaged in three very different works. David Wells is a professor of theology at Gordon-Conwell Seminary north of Boston. John Armstrong, as you know, is pastor of that large Grace Church out in Southern California. And Mike Horton, younger man, is the founder of a parachurch work known as Cure, now joining with the Bible Study Hour in a work which has become the New Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, three men from three different backgrounds, three different kinds of training, looking out at the evangelical church and in one way or another saying the same thing. Not very long ago, David Wells spoke at a meeting of the National Association of Evangelicals. They had invited him to come because of his book, No Place for Truth. It was an attempt to expose the weakness of the evangelical church, and the NAE was concerned by that, so they said, come and share some of your thoughts with us, and he did, and he described what he saw as the bleeding of the evangelical church. He wrote this, we have produced by our large churches and impressive ministry budgets only a fool's paradise. We've lost our evangelical soul and an evangelical faith that is not passionate about truth and righteousness is a faith which is a lost cause. 
Now that's why the alliance of confessing evangelicals came into being. David Wells and R.C. and I and a number of other people, a dozen or so, have met together to see if something can't be done. And last April in Boston, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, we held a meeting, a summit meeting of about 110 leaders from across the country and produced a document known as the Cambridge Declaration. And what these men have tried to do in the Cambridge Declaration is the purpose of the Alliance, namely to call on evangelicals to repent of their worldliness and recover the great truths of the Bible, as did the Reformers in their time. In other words, we're saying we had better have a new Reformation. Now, what better place to start than with the doctrine of justification by faith? When I was speaking this morning and talking about election, I said that is not, in my judgment, the point at which you would normally begin a biblical theology. Even John Calvin, when he became so known for his identification with the doctrine of election, did not include it in book one of the Institutes, or even in book two. It doesn't come in until the end of book three, along with the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. But that's not what I would say about justification by faith. Justification by faith is the gospel. And if we don't maintain that, or as I would suggest we have to do, recover that in our time, the evangelical church as a church is lost. David Wells says the evangelical church in America is either dead or dying because it's forgotten its theology. It's not evaporating as a sociological presence. We have big churches. We have big budgets. But as a religious force in America, the evangelical church has lost its soul, and it's lost its soul because it's lost its theology. Now, the most important thing we have to recover is this doctrine because, as you well know, and as Martin Luther said, it's the doctrine by which the church stands or falls. It wasn't only Luther that said that. All of the Reformers understood that to be the case. John Calvin spoke of justification as the main hinge on which salvation turns. Thomas Cranmer, one of the architects of the Church of England, called justification the strong rock and foundation of Christian religion. He declared that whoever denies this doctrine is not to be counted as a true Christian. Or Thomas Watson, one of the great Puritans, wrote, Justification is the very hinge and pillar of Christianity. An error about justification is dangerous, like a defect in a foundation. Justification by Christ is a spring of the water of life. To have the poison of corrupt doctrine cast into that spring is damnable. And then Luther, we know Luther the best. When the article of justification has fallen, everything has fallen. This is the chief article from which all other doctrines have flowed. It alone begets, nourishes, builds, preserves, and defends the church of God. And without it, the church of God cannot stand for one hour. Luther said the justification is the master and prince, the Lord, the ruler, and the judge over all kinds of doctrines. Those statements are not exaggerations. That's simple truth, because the doctrine of justification by faith is God's answer to the fundamental human problem, and the fundamental human problem is this, how do we get right with a holy God? We're not right with a holy God, we're at war with God. We're sinners, corrupt in thought, word, and deed, and we compound our corruption every single day. How do people like us ever get right with a holy God? Justification is the answer, and if we don't maintain that answer in our churches, not only have we forgotten doctrine, we've ceased to be a true church. We've abandoned the gospel. Well, that's what we want to talk about. I've been impressed in this conference because we're dealing with these great biblical themes that in every case, the men who have been speaking on them have begun and ended with Scripture. And that's what I'd like to do as well. Romans 3, if you have your Bibles, turn to it. I'd like to begin reading with verse 19 of this great chapter. It's somewhat of a summary of what Paul has said in the previous chapters because he's talking about 
sin and the pervasiveness of sin and what it's done to the race, and he sums that up. But then in verse 21, he makes the great contrast and begins to talk about the gospel. So I want to read 19 through 26. Here is the Apostle Paul writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. But now, a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now, there are a lot of key terms there. That's probably one of the most condensed theological passages in the New Testament, and I want to call your attention to three of them that had to do with the work of God in our salvation. One is the subject of this address, justification. You find it in verse 24. Second one is redemption. You find it in the same verse. And then finally, verse 25, what really is propitiation, but it's translated in the New International Version, sacrifice of atonement. I like the New International Version, but I wish they had kept propitiation at that point. I talked to Roger Nicole about it, one of the translators at one time. He said, well, we had to say sacrifice of atonement because nobody today knows what propitiation means. Well, hardly anybody today knows what sacrifice of atonement means, but I heard him and respect him, and maybe that is a good translation, but the word is propitiation. Now, I'd like to put a little diagram up here. I, I don't normally do that. You see, when I preach in Philadelphia with a big stone pulpit and you can't really move around very well, and I stand there. I don't even have a portable microphone when I preach, but I've been hanging around R.C., and R.C. always, <laughs> always goes over to the blackboard. At any rate, I want to give you a diagram which I think you might find helpful for a number of things because it contains those three words. It's in the form of a triangle. I don't even know if you can see these on television. I haven't done this before. But this triangle has God the Father at the apex. And then down here on this lower corner, it has Jesus Christ. And then over here it has ourselves. Christian men and women. And when I write that, I understand why I don't use the blackboard. I do, nobody can read it anyway. Besides, it's not even straight. But at any rate, here's this triangle, and these three points are connected by three lines, and they go like that. And each one of those lines stands for one of those terms that you find in Romans 3. Over here on the left, you have propitiation. I'll just abbreviate it. And over here, on this side you have justification, and down below here you have redemption. Now each of those words comes from one aspect of ancient life. The word propitiation is the hardest one to understand, and that's why it's translated sacrifice of atonement. It comes from the ancient world of religion, and it describes what a worshiper would do when he presented a sacrifice to turn aside the wrath of God. You know, we look at pagans in the past and we think they were far inferior to us in spiritual understanding, but in many ways they were far superior to people that live in our time because people in the past understood that they did wrong things. They had a sense that they were sinners. And so the argument went like this, if we live in a universe that's run by God or gods, whoever the gods may be, and if there's any sense of morality among the gods, and if I do bad things, and sooner or later this God or God is going to get me. And so what I have to learn to do is turn aside the wrath of God 
so he won't punish me for my sin. And so the worshiper would come with his sacrifices. Now, that word has been taken over into the Bible and appears in the New Testament a number of times. Somebody would say at that point, but how in the world could a term like that, as corrupt as it is, suggesting that the worshiper somehow in himself can turn aside the wrath of God? How could a word like that ever be taken over into the New Testament? Well, it is taken over because the concept is right. It's just the subject of the action that changes. You see, if that word propitiation were on this side of the triangle, describing the relationship between ourselves and God as if somehow we were able to turn aside the wrath of God, that would be pagan religion. It wouldn't be Christianity. But in Christianity, propitiation is on this side, and it describes what Jesus Christ does in reference to the Father by the sacrifice of His life. That's how He turns aside the wrath of God. If you want to do that in grammatical terms, Jesus Christ is the subject of that action and God the Father is the object. I indicate it by an arrow and it goes like that. So when we talk about a sacrifice of atonement or propitiation, it describes something that Jesus Christ does in relationship to God. Now, redemption down on the bottom describes what Jesus Christ does in relationship to us. Jesus propitiates the Father, but He redeems His people. That word is borrowed from the ancient world of commerce. It's a commercial term. It means to buy or sell. And because so much of the buying and selling of the ancient world had to do with slaves in the biblical pattern, it really describes how Jesus Christ frees us from our bondage to sin by His work on our behalf. So that's redemption. And then over here, this third word, the one we're interested in is justification. And that arrow goes like that because God the Father justifies the ungodly that they might be able to stand before Him. That word comes from the ancient world of law. It's a legal term, and it describes what God has done. Now, the reason I put the diagram up there is to suggest a number of things. First of all, you don't require a great deal of understanding to look at a diagram like that and recognize that we contribute nothing. Right? The great problem in religion is always to think that we're contributing something, whether it's good works or our devotion or our piety or our faith or whatever it may be. We don't contribute anything at all. Jesus Christ does something when He redeems us, and God the Father does something when He justifies us. And furthermore, it shows that Jesus is the Savior. He's the one on whom it all hinges. But most important, and because of that that I refer to it, it shows how justification fits in because it describes how God justifies the ungodly, not because they are godly, but because Jesus Christ has taken the wrath of God due to them upon Himself. Now, that's what we're dealing with in justification. One of the great errors in dealing with justification comes from doing something which we usually rightly do when we study technical terms. That is, if you have a word you don't understand, one thing it's very helpful to do is break it down. And if you can do that in terms of the etymology, you know, what words it's put together from, well, then presumably you get a better understanding of what it is. When you do that with justification, you're misled. And for this reason, justification, our English word, comes from the Latin justificare, and that word itself is made up of two parts, justice on the one hand, right or righteous or upright before God, and on the other hand, facio facere, which means to make or to do. So if you break the word down etymologically, justification means to make righteous. And that was Luther's problem. Luther knew Hebrew somewhat, and he certainly knew Greek, but he functioned for the most part in the Latin Vulgate, which was the Latin translation of the Scriptures most in use in his time. And when he came to that word justification, and justification to him meant to make righteous, and he understood that that was the gospel, Luther said, I hated the gospel. You know how Luther said it. He said, God must be an ogre up in heaven because he's not content to make us miserable by the application of the law. On top of the law, he adds the gospel, and the gospel is even worse. Because if the good news, forget the bad news, if the good news is that you have to be made righteous, Luther was perfectly aware he would never make it. 
He tried. He did everything he was supposed to do in that day. He left the secular profession. He entered the monastery. He learned to pray. He used to beat himself and starve himself and all of that to try and be made righteous according to the wisdom of the day. Unfortunately, he had a good superior in the monastery, a man named Staupitz. And Staupitz said, Luther, you're not going to get anywhere this way. What I've learned is that you have to trust God. He set him to work studying the Bible. And the Reformation began with Luther's study of the Bible. Luther went to the Bible and he began to study it and he began to realize as he studied it that he was misled by that common understanding of the word justification. Justification, justificare in the Latin was a translation of a Greek term, but the Greek term did not mean to make righteous. The Greek term came from the world of law and it had to do with the act of the judge in acquitting one who was accused and declaring one who had been brought before the bar of his justice to be in a right standing before the law. When Luther began to see that and understand that we're declared righteous before the bar of God's justice, not on the basis of any righteousness in us, either possessed now or to be possessed hereafter, but by the righteousness of Christ imparted to us, when Luther understood that, he said, I pass through the gate of paradise into heaven. And Luther understood what it really is to be a Christian. Now that's what we're talking about in justification. Leon Morris in his definition of it says, justification is a legal term indicating the process of declaring righteous. It's the exact opposite of condemnation. What happens when a judge condemns someone? Does the judge make the guilty person guilty by condemning them? No. What he's acknowledging is that they are guilty. And so he pronounces a decree of guilty in exactly the opposite way when the judge pronounces a decree of justification. It doesn't have to do with making that person righteous in himself, but it's a way of declaring that he stands in a right relationship before the law. And that's on the basis of the work of Christ. It's because Jesus has propitiated the Father taking the wrath of God against sin upon Himself, and because God the Father gives us the righteousness of Christ, that we are justified. And that, my friends, is the gospel. Now, there's a little more to it than that, and I want to expand on that just a little bit. Sometimes we hear that this doctrine of justification is best expressed as justification by faith alone. And then sometimes we hear people talking about justification by grace alone. And we say, well, what is it? Is it justification by faith alone or is it justification by grace alone? And the answer is all of the above. Furthermore, something else has to be added and what has to be added in addition is that it's because of the work of Jesus Christ alone. So if you want a full definition of justification, it goes like this. Justification is an act of God by which He declares sinners to be righteous by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. Now let me give it again. Justification is an act of God by which He declares sinners to be righteous by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. Now that's what Paul's teaching in Romans 3. You take each of those parts and you go back and you look at the third chapter of Romans, you find that's exactly what he's saying. The source of our justification is the grace of God. That's verse 24. We're declared justified freely by His grace. We're we talking about grace alone. That's the sole source of our justification. He also talks about the work of Christ in verse 25 and following. It's through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, His work. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement. He doesn't bring anything else in there. He's not mentioning the saints. He's not mentioning our works. It's the work of Christ and the work of Christ alone. And then it's also by faith, isn't it? Because that word faith just runs through this paragraph and even the paragraph that follows. I find the word faith appearing there eight times. This righteousness from God comes through faith. It is through faith in His blood. It is for those who have faith in Jesus. Are we justified by observing the law? No, on the basis 
of faith and so on. So you've got faith there. Now I want to ask the question, is that the gospel that you're hearing in your churches week by week? We have a lot of pastors here. I speak as a pastor to pastors. Is that the gospel that you are preaching to your people week by week? Or is it more often the case? I won't say exclusively, but more often the case that what you're really preaching is a feel-good gospel or a gospel of self-help or a little bit of help by the grace of God to overcome the problems that you have in your life day by day. I believe that God has answers to our problems. I believe that He works in our lives to give victory over sin. All of that's important, but the gospel, the gospel is justification by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. And brothers and sisters, if we are not preaching that today in our churches, if we are not hearing that today in our churches, if we are not trusting that as the hope of being able to stand one day before the face of the Holy God, we are not true churches. And we need a new reformation. You ever hear people give testimonies today? I hear a lot of them. The session has to interview members. We take in lots of members year by year. And most testimonies are something like this. They say, I was confused or lonely, and you know, I went away to school, and I met some Christians, and they got me to believe on Jesus, and God has solved all my problems. I'm doing pretty well now. Most of our testimonies are like that. But I find that when testimonies are given before our session, there aren't a whole lot to talk about justification by faith, how God by grace picked me a hopeless sinner and has declared me righteous on the basis of the work of Jesus Christ. You ever hear the testimony of Charles Haddon Spurgeon? Listen, here's a man who knew what it was to be converted. When I was under the hand of the Holy Spirit, wrote Spurgeon, under conviction of sin, I had a clear and sharp sense of the justice of God. Sin, whatever it might be to other people, became to me an intolerable burden. I knew myself to be so horribly guilty that I remember feeling that if God did not punish me for my sin, He ought to do it. I felt that the judge of all the earth ought to condemn such sin as mine. I had upon my mind a deep concern for the honor of God's name and the integrity of His moral government. I, I felt that it would not satisfy my conscience if I could be forgiven unjustly. The sin I had committed must be punished. But then there was the question of how God could be just and yet justify me who had been so guilty. I was worried and wearied with this question, neither see any answer to it. Certainly, I could never have invented an answer which would have satisfied my conscience. Then I saw that Jesus had borne the penalty on my behalf. Why did He suffer if not to turn aside the penalty from us? If then He turned it aside by His death, it's turned aside, and those who believe in Him need not fear it. It must be so that since expiation is made, God is able to forgive without shaking the basis of His throne. Now that's a conversion, and that's what we need to see again in our day. Now, why is it under attack in our day, and why are we forgetting it? No use fighting the battles of the Reformation all over again. We're living in a different age. And the attacks on the great doctrines come in different ways in different times. What's happening is that we're forgetting these things because other concerns in our lives and in our churches are pushing them aside. I remember that at the time of the great Diamond Jubilee in the reign of Queen Victoria, somebody got the idea for this great occasion of asking the greatest, certainly the most popular English poet of the day, Rudyard Kipling, to write a poem for the occasion. It was a magnificent occasion. The empire was at the height of its grandeur, and for the Diamond Jubilee, people of note poured into London and other places in England literally from all over the world. The Thames was filled with these great ships that bore 
the dignitaries from the far-flung British Empire. And Kipling was supposed to write a poem that said how glorious England was. And Kipling was a perceptive man, and as he thought about it, he trembled at the arrogance and the self-satisfaction that had gone into that particular jubilee. He wrote his poem. It was called The Recessional of 1901, and you may know it. Let me just give the first stanza. It goes like this. God of our fathers known of old, Lord of our far-flung battle line beneath whose awesome hand we hold dominion over palm and pine. Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. That has to be said to the evangelicals today. That's not a popular thing to say. It wasn't popular when Kipling said it. The wisdom of the moment is that he was on his way to becoming poet laureate. Once he wrote that poem, he didn't have a prayer. And I think when you speak in the evangelical church today, to suggest that the evangelicals are forgetting their theology is not at all popular. David Wells did it in No Place for Truth. He said in a review of that book in Christianity Today, he who curses the darkness should light a candle. And so he wrote his next book, God in the Wasteland, and they wouldn't even review it. Well, it's not popular, but we have to do it. How is it the case that we're forgetting these things in our day. Well, let me suggest it. When the Reformers spoke about sola gratia, grace alone, they wanted to insist that the sinner has no claim upon God. God doesn't owe us anything at all. If He let us go to hell, every single one of us, God would be absolutely just, and the angels in heaven throughout all eternity would still be able to praise God. But evangelicals are forgetting that. And they're forgetting it for a number of reasons. They think that human beings are basically good, like the rest of the world around us. They think that God owes everyone a chance to be saved, as most people would say if you asked them the question. And they think that in the final analysis, we're saved because of our own good decision to receive Jesus or come to terms with God or embrace the gospel. Now, that's why the doctrine of election is opposed by so many people. I was talking about election this morning. It's always a wonder how anything that's taught that clearly in the Word of God can seem so wrong to so many people who are supposed to be students of the Word and Christians, but the reason is perfectly obvious, we don't think it's fair. And what do we mean when we say we don't think it's fair? What we mean is that God owes us something, right? That's what it means when you talk about being fair. We might not say necessarily he owes everyone salvation, but he at least owes everyone a chance at salvation. And so when we come up against the doctrine of election, somehow we rebel, and the reason is that we don't really understand or believe that it's of the grace of God. Grace, yes, a little bit, maybe even a lot, but not grace alone. We're willing to say that God was gracious in sending Jesus, and He's gracious in sending people to preach the gospel, but not grace alone, because somehow He owed it to us. And that's the way we lose it in our time. I suppose it's also why we find grace so boring. Isn't that something? Years ago, we used to talk about amazing grace. Today, it's boring grace. J.I. Packer wrote about that some time ago. He said, that's really Amazing, isn't it? He said, you go to an average congregation, you try to talk about the grace of God, people don't even know what you're talking about. You get blank stares. They don't contradict you. Well, they just have nothing to contribute. They're not functioning on that level. You talk about the budget, oh, you get their attention then. And <laughs> talk about sports, of course. Christians will get with you on that. But talk about the grace of God, it's just sort of a, a non-meaningful term to most of them. And Packer asks, why is that? He says it's because we don't understand a lot of other doctrines. We don't really understand the sin of man. We don't think we're really sinners, or at least not very much. We don't appreciate the judgment of God. We've lost in our day any sense of the relationship between cause and effect. We think we do anything at all. We don't have to worry 
about the judgment of God. The judgment of God is one of the most unreal of all possible concepts to people, and yet it's throughout Scripture, and it dominates in the last book of the Bible, Revelation. We don't appreciate the spiritual inability of man. We think that with human beings all things are possible. And we forget that when Jesus was asked about that, He said, with God all things are possible. And last of all, we don't appreciate the sovereign freedom of God to give or to withhold salvation as He pleases. You see what's happening? We don't have these doctrines, and so we don't have grace, and without grace, we don't really understand justification, and the heart of it is lost. The Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals that I mentioned a moment ago has dealt with this in the Cambridge Declaration. I want to read you just a little bit of how these leaders meeting in Cambridge saw the problem. Their statement goes like this, unwarranted confidence in human ability is a product of fallen human nature. This false confidence now fills the evangelical world, from the self-esteem gospel to the health and wealth gospel, from those who have transformed the gospel into a product to be sold and sinners into consumers who want to buy to others who treat Christian faith as being true simply because it works. This silences the doctrine of justification regardless of the official statements of our churches. God's grace in Christ is not merely necessary, but is the sole efficient cause of salvation. We confess that human beings are born spiritually dead and are incapable even of cooperating with regenerating grace. And then they added some affirmations and denials. We reaffirm that in salvation we are rescued from God's wrath by His grace alone. It is the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that brings us to Christ by releasing us from our bondage to sin and raising us from spiritual death to spiritual life. And we deny that salvation is in any sense a human work. Human methods, techniques, or strategies by themselves cannot accomplish this transformation. Faith is not produced by our unregenerated human nature. Now, that's biblical theology, and it's what the evangelicals are forgetting. We need to recapture these convictions, because unless we do, we really don't have the gospel, we betrayed the gospel, and we're not even a true church. Well, that's grace. How about solus Christus, Christ alone? We need to remember that as well. When the Reformers used that phrase, they meant that Christ's work on the cross is the sole basis of our salvation. Now, what have evangelicals done in that area? Well, here the problem is our neglect of Jesus as a Savior. The problem with grace is that we have rejected it. The problem with the work of Christ is that we simply neglect it because we put other things in its place. You say, how can that be? If, if anyone talks about Jesus on the cross, it's the evangelicals. Let me suggest how. Lacking a sound biblical and well-understood theology, we have become a prey to the consumerism of our times, and a therapeutic worldview has swept over us, replacing the categories of the gospel. The polls tell us that the gospel most evangelicals believe in is that God helps us to help ourselves. Large percentage of evangelicals, when they're polled, agree with that statement. The gospel we actually believe in has a lot to do with self-esteem, good mental attitudes, and worldly success. There's almost no preaching about sin, hell, judgment, or the wrath of God, and even less the doctrines that center in Christ and His cross, grace, redemption, atonement, propitiation, justification, and even faith. So lacking a sound biblical theology, all these other things push the real gospel out, and we identify it with the popular idols of our time like a political philosophy or psychology, or some sociological understanding of human need. Now, let me read what the Cambridge Declaration says on this point. 
As evangelical faith has become secularized, its interests have been blurred with those of the culture. The result is a loss of absolute values, permissive individualism, and a substitution of wholeness for holiness, recovery for repentance, intuition for truth, feeling for belief, chance for providence, and immediate gratification for enduring hope. Christ and His cross have been removed from the center of our vision. And then the document makes these statements. We reaffirm that our salvation is accomplished by the mediatorial work of the historical Christ alone. His sinless life and substitutionary atonement alone are sufficient for our justification and our reconciliation to the Father. And then the denial. We deny that the gospel is preached if Christ's substitutionary work is not declared and faith in Christ and His work is not solicited. How do we stand up when we're measured by that aspect of what justification is all about? Well, there's one more. We talked about sola gratia, grace alone, solus Christus, which is Christ alone. Now we talk about faith alone, sola fide. What's happened here? Well, if evangelicals have destroyed grace by rejecting it and have destroyed Christ alone by neglect, what we've done in the area of faith is destroy it by making it less than the Bible declares faith to be. We have to have faith. That's what Romans 3 is talking about. I read some of the text. There's no salvation apart from faith, but what is faith? Well, in all classical definitions of theology, faith is understood to have three elements. It has the element of content, and then it has the element of agreement or assent to that which one comes to understand. And finally, it has the element of trust, or some would say commitment in the one who is presented in the gospel. What evangelicals have done is weaken that so that faith becomes merely an intellectual assent to certain doctrines. And some even go so far as to say, once saved, always saved. So if you came forward at a meeting when you were 10 years old and agreed in a certain superficial way to something that you heard the preacher say, then you're saved. And because you're saved, you're always saved. And it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference if you go out from that time on and live exactly like the world. Be better if you lived like a Christian, but you're still all right. You're going to go to heaven. Some have even said it's hard to believe that a person who at one point has made a kind of commitment later in life can actually apostatize, fall away from the gospel, repudiate Christ and everything he or she affirmed earlier, and it's okay because once saved, always saved. Now something's wrong when we begin to hear that kind of theology. So what do we mean when we talk about faith? Well, knowledge, first of all, it has content. If you read what John Calvin has to say about faith, and he deals with it at great length in the Institutes, you begin to realize that he was facing a unique problem in his day, and it's an understandable one. In Calvin's day, indeed in the time of the Reformation generally, people didn't have the Scriptures, even the priests didn't have them, and so people were untaught. They were Christian superficially. They would come to church and they would do what the church told them to do, but they didn't understand the gospel, and so there was real no content any faith that they would have. So the question was raised, how could people that don't even understand the gospel be Christians as we want them to be since they're all coming to our churches? And the answer to that in the Roman Catholic Church of the day was the doctrine of implicit faith. You don't have to actually understand it. You just have to give agreement implicitly to what the church believes. The church understands it. And so I may not understand it, but whatever the church believes, that's what I believe. A man came to be interviewed by a session on one occasion, and the session was trying to find out the extent of his faith, and so they said to him, why well, not just tell us a little bit what you believe? And he said, I believe what the church believes. They weren't quite satisfied with that, so they, uh, they probed a little further. They said, well, what does the church believe? He said, the church believes what I believe. <laughs> they weren't satisfied yet, so they pressed it a bit further, and they said, well, just what do you in the church believe? He said, we believe the same thing. 
Now, now that in a sense is what Calvin was up against. And Calvin was well aware that that kind of a faith is not true faith. Nobody is saved with that kind of faith. And so he writes about it very forcefully. And here's what he says. The object of faith is Christ, and that faith rests upon knowledge and not upon pious ignorance. We do not obtain salvation either because we're prepared to embrace as true whatever the church has prescribed or because we turn over to it the task of inquiring and knowing, but we do so when we know that God is our merciful Father because of reconciliation affected through Jesus Christ and that Christ has been given to us as righteousness and sanctification and life. By this knowledge, I say, not by submission of our feelings do we obtain entry into the kingdom of heaven. And I ask this question, if we're not preaching these things in our churches, if we're preaching a therapeutic gospel instead, what is the content of the faith we believe our people actually are exercising? Doesn't it come down to the fact that we believe we're pretty good people and that God owes us salvation and somehow it's all going to come out all right regardless of how I live? That is not the gospel. So content's the first thing. What's the second thing? The second thing is what is often called assent or agreement. It's when this begins to touch you at some level. It's not just an intellectual doctrine. Quite often, People refer to the experience of John Wesley. At this point, Wesley, as you know, had been an evangelist in America for a number of years. He certainly understood theology to some extent. He was off teaching it in the New World. But Wesley gives an account in his journal, you find it in the first volume of the works of Wesley, of what happened to him when he was in London. One occasion after he had come back from America, he went to a little meeting on a Sunday in Aldersgate Street in London, the place is marked, though the meeting house is gone. And when he went in and sat in this upstairs room, somebody was reading the preface of Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. It was a great sermon. It had to do with justification by faith. And Wesley said that as he listened to that, his heart was strangely warmed. And for the first time in his life, it began to touch him in a personal way. Here's the way he put it. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that He had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. I like even better what Calvin says. He has a wonderful way of writing at times, and here's the way Calvin makes the second point. He's already talked about the content, but now he says, it now remains to pour into the heart itself what the mind has absorbed. For the Word of God is not received by faith if it flits about in the top of the brain, but when it takes root in the depth of the heart, that it may be an invincible defense to withstand and drive off all the stratagems of temptation. So the content, the warming of the heart, and last of all, the trust or commitment. In other words, for faith to be saving faith, we have to come to that expression of the Apostle Thomas when he finally was confronted by the risen Christ and fell at His feet and said, My Lord, and my God. Here's what the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals writes in its declaration, we reaffirm that justification is by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. In justification, Christ's righteousness is imputed to us as the only possible satisfaction of God's perfect justice. We deny that justification rests on any merit to be found in us or upon the grounds of an infusion of Christ's righteousness in us or that an institution claiming to be a church that denies or condemns sola fide can be recognized as a legitimate church. And to that we all ought to be able to say, Amen. Now I'd like to give two illustrations 
about saving faith as we end, and the first one is a common one, but a good one. It has to do with the way a young couple will first meet, fall in love, and get married. First of all, they meet, and if they have any sense at all, they begin to spend some time together and exchange information sort of to find out what the other one is like. And that corresponds to the content element of faith. And then the time comes when this young couple actually falls in love, and that's the ascent portion. Now they're not just saying, that's the kind of man I would like to have for a husband, or that's the kind of girl I would like for a wife. They're saying, I want him, and he's saying, I want her. But you see, even that isn't the marriage. And the time has to come when that couple who have gotten to know one another and have fallen in love stand before the minister and take their vows. And he says, I, John, take thee, Mary, to be my wedded wife, and I do promise and covenant before God and these witnesses to be thy loving and faithful husband in plenty and in want and joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, as long as we both shall live. And she looks into his face and she repeats the words like this, I, Mary, take thee, John, to be my wedded husband, and I do promise and covenant before God and these witnesses to be thy loving and faithful wife in plenty and in want, in sickness and in sorrow, as long as we both shall live. And the minister says, I now join this man and this woman in holy marriage, and they go out man and wife. Now that's what happens in salvation. Jesus Christ took the vows first of all. He said, I, Jesus, take thee, sinner, to be my wedded wife, my disciple, to be joined with me for all eternity, and I do promise and covenant before God the Heavenly Father to be a faithful Savior, Bridegroom, and Lord to you in sickness and in health and plenty and in want for this life and for all eternity. And we look up into His face and we repeat the words after Him. We say, I, sinner, take Thee, Jesus, to be my Savior and Bridegroom and Lord. And I do promise and covenant before God the Heavenly Father and these witnesses too to be a faithful disciple until my life's end and indeed forever. And it's God the Father who pronounces that marriage. And we who beforehand were Miss Sinner go out of that service with the name of Christ affixed to us, and we are now Mrs. Christian. Now that's the first example. I give the second because the first example isn't perfect. No human example is. And the problem with the first example is that in a human marriage, both parties bring something to the marriage. And when we're talking about justification by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone, we have to understand that you and I bring nothing. And if we think we're bringing something, we're really not joined to Christ in that saving relationship. Here's the illustration. It comes from Paul's own testimony, the way he talks about it in Philippians. You know, there are several places in the New Testament where Paul gives his testimony. Some of them are like our testimonies. They're more or less circumstantial and historical. Paul says, I was on the way to Damascus and a bright light shone from heaven. I heard the voice of Jesus say, that's the historical kind. He tended to do that when he was appearing before the governors and the kings. But in Philippians, he gives what I would call a theological testimony. It refers to the same event, but he expresses it quite differently. And it goes like this, chapter 3. Verses 4 through 7, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, blameless. But whatever was to my profit, I considered loss for the sake of Christ. Now, when he talks about profit and loss, he's talking about something we understand. He's saying he had a balance sheet in his life. He had assets and liabilities, and it goes something like this. He had a great big line down the middle of his life, just like that, and over here he had assets, and over here he had liabilities. And he thought, as most people do think, that the way you get to heaven is by accumulating assets. And he said, I was doing that all my life. There were assets I inherited. I was circumcised, sign of the covenant, 
He said, I belong to Israel, the covenant name of the people of God. He said, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was from the tribe of Benjamin. All of that was good inherited credentials. And he said, in addition to that, there were the credentials I earned for myself. Because I became a Pharisee. Nobody had to be a Pharisee. But he said, I took that on, that yoke of separation under the law and obedience. And not only was I a member of the club, he said, I was a zealous Pharisee. And if you don't believe that, just talk to the Christians because I spent a great deal of my time trying to persecute them. I thought they were heretics that were destroying the true religion. And then he said, as far as the righteousness and the law was concerned, because I was trying to be saved the way I thought you had to be saved, by keeping the law, as far as that is concerned, I was blameless. But then he said, something happened to me. He said, I was on the road to Damascus, and Jesus Christ appeared to me in His glory, and for the first time in my life, I understood what true righteousness was. I thought, you see, that all of this added up to righteousness, and I was going to get to heaven by being righteous. And I, I, I saw Christ in His glory, and I knew that wasn't righteousness at all. It was all filthy rags. Well, it didn't measure up. But he said, I learned something else. Not only did my assets not add up to righteousness, my assets weren't even assets. They were actually liabilities because what they were doing was keeping me from Christ. And so what happened is that whatever was to my profit, I learned to consider loss for the sake of Christ. And what he did was this. He took that whole column of accumulated assets, which he'd spent his whole life acquiring and of which he was so proud, and he moved it over here into the column of liabilities and under assets. He wrote, Jesus Christ alone. And we sing about it in some of our hymns, and one of them by Augustus Toplady goes like this, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress, helpless. Look to Thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in Thee." That man understood the gospel. That's the gospel we need to recover, and it needs to begin with you and me. Let's pray. Our Father. We're at best unprofitable servants. And left to ourselves, not only do we fail to understand, we substitute all kinds of false gospels in the place of that one true gospel that centers on Your grace and the work of Christ. Our Father, we live in bad times, and we can't blame it on others. We're part of the problem, not part of the solution, but we do ask because of that same grace which You show to us in the gospel, You would be pleased to send a recovery of the gospel in our time and allow us to see something in the nature of a new reformation. For Jesus' sake alone, amen.